An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 18, July 24th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, I concluded the last session by trying to show you precisely how dialectical thinking stands in contradiction to the essentially administrative mode of thought which prevails today. And if I now continue to speak about one of the particular difficulties which dialectical thought presents for us, this is perhaps because it touches upon that aspect of contemporary consciousness which is most obviously marked by such administrative thinking. I am talking about the tendency to think in simple alternatives, to model thought on the research questionnaire, to encourage the kind of thinking which in totalitarian states expects people to produce the relevant papers to show whether they are Aryan or non-Aryan, proletarian or non-proletarian, right thinking or dissident, or whatever it may be. The world in which we live tends to determine the fate of human beings under the rubrics of precisely such narrowly defined classes, just as we now witness something like a cruelly ironic fulfillment of the idealist thesis of the identity of thought and being insofar as all possible categorical forms, all possible merely organizational forms which derive from the realm of administration and have been foisted upon the human world are turning into powers, and indeed into fearful powers, and the real life of humanity. It is the kind of thought which can be characterized in the old words of the German cabaret singer who asked, are you for or against? Or are you for or are you against? And whenever you get involved in political or other discussions, you will almost always encounter this tendency to force people to declare quite unambiguously whether they are for or against something. I will not consider here how far the concept of engagement, which has become so popular today, is basically identical with such thinking in terms of alternatives. I sometimes harbor the suspicion that this is indeed so. In Germany, there is naturally a specific background to this administrative mentality, one which probably has something to do with the German Protestant tradition, just as it was characteristic of the German situation, which dialectical thought was destined to challenge, that a certain inwardness was also curiously combined with that administrative mentality. This is something that actually still awaits adequate analysis, and the circumstance in question accounts for the extremely compromised character of the concept of inwardness which is involved here. Anyway, I can clearly remember how violently, even as a child, I rebelled against the saying, he that is not with me is against me. For this already seems to imply under the ethical pretext that we have to decide rather than remain lukewarm, that we are forced to assume certain alternatives or certain decisions which in reality are not derived from the authority of autonomous thought at all, and where we must appeal instead to the concept of decision and accept something externally prescribed for us in a heteronomous fashion. Thus, we have no other choice but to decide between one sim sample and um, one sample on offer and another, between two such alternatives and the concept of free decision which is postulated here is already effectively negated once we are confronted by these possibilities. This is typically the form in which heteronomous thought is imposed upon us under every conceivable imaginable, imaginable pretext as the only conceivable kind of thought there is, just as we would really have to describe the regressive thought which prevails today principally as a reversion to heteronomy. heteronomy as indeed Paul Tillich very perceptively argued over a quarter of a century ago. But the particular difficulty which the dialectic presents for thought in general at this point is this. The dialectic itself cannot simply become the opposite of an either or. In other words, dialectical theory and dialectical thought cannot be read in terms of a both end. And I imagine that you will recognize both the difficulty and the provocation of dialectical thought very clearly in this regard. It is neither an either or, like the aforementioned choice between pre-established alternatives, nor a both end, like a weighing up of mutually conflicting possibilities between which we are supposed to discover the middle way.
It is the historical fate of the dialectic, which hails from Hegel, that its central concept, that of mediation, has been misunderstood in the very sense I have just tried to point out for you. For people have imagined that to think dialectically is basically to think that there is something good and also something bad about every conceivable thing, and this has therefore eventually dragged dialectic itself down into the ubiquitous broth of conformist consciousness, thereby reconciling it with that well-meaning relativism which claims that there is something to every position, while also claiming the opposite, namely that everything that, everything that exists has good and bad sides as well. Now, I will certainly not deny that this motif is also involved in the distinctive perspective of dialectic, which attempts to do justice to objects in all their complexity, and indeed there is a specific moment of humanity here, insofar as this attitude of both end at least negates the assumption that consciousness must exercise some kind of judicial function in the face of what confronts it, by strictly separating its objects into the sheep and the goats. But once we have acknowledged this motif of dialectical thought, we must certainly not ignore the other dimension, the insight that what is described as mediation in the dialectic is not a middle way between extremes. Rather, and this seems to me to be the really decisive thing here, we must recognize that dialectical thought itself can move only through its extremes towards that moment with which it is not itself identical. In other words, if I may express this in a phonomic fashion, dialectical mediation is not a mean between opposed terms, for it is only produced by entering into the heart of the extreme, and it is precisely by driving this extreme to the uttermost point that we become aware of its opposite within the extreme itself. In accordance with the logical structure which I attempted to explicate for you right at the beginning, or at least in the first few few sessions of these lectures. What we are talking about today is not the logical aspect of this movement through the extremes, but rather the ethical aspect of thinking, if I may put it that way. Thus, when we attempt to point out the historical limitation or the questionable character of some progressive phenomenon or other, we do not do so by contrasting the more even and moderate side with the more advanced or progressive side of the phenomenon and qualifying the former as superior. Rather, we are critically compelled to drive those questionable moments themselves in the direction where they might genuinely be corrected, to promote self-reflection with regard to the phenomenon in question, and, where possible, to encourage its further development in a clearer and more consistent form than it had formerly exhibited. To be honest, I am speaking rather pro domo here, for I have repeatedly found when I felt compelled in my aesthetic writings to exercise decidedly critical judgment regarding certain avant-garde phenomena that, while this met with a kind of problematic enthusiasm among the public, it met with a kind of disappointment among many avant-garde friends, as if I had finally come to see reason and was now prepared to defend the claim, thus far and no further, something that I would actually regard as a completely undialectical proposition. There is no power in the world which can arrest the movement of critical thought, and if dialectic itself has ever been tempted in certain contexts, as in its critique of so-called reflective thought, to abort the process of critical reflection, this is surely its cardinal sin, and the very moment which implies that we cannot simply stay with the Hegelian dialectic itself. But if critical thought fully engages with a, with a progressive phenomenon, this cannot mean invoking an average and wholly familiar expression of human reason in this, in this regard. It can only mean the attempt to reveal the higher potential of the phenomenon, whose inadequacies are in question by bringing its own principle ever more powerfully to bear. Or to express this more substantively, if we must constantly recognize a dialectic of enlightenment, namely a dialectic of rationality which compels us to acknowledge all the sacrifice and injustice which the path of enlightenment has brought in its course, this should not mean and cannot mean that we try and return to something before this enlightenment, or that we cultivate protected nature parks of irrationality. It should mean and can only mean that we also recognize the wounds which enlightenment has left behind, as the moments where enlightenment itself betrays its own imperfect character and reveals that it is actually not yet enlightened enough. 
and it is only by pursuing the principle of enlightenment through to the end that these wounds may perhaps be healed. This is the distinctive position of dialectical thought which is indeed difficult to grasp and extraordinarily difficult to occupy and maintain consistently, a position which refuses to think in terms of simple alternatives, but equally refuses any facile reconciliation of these alternatives. I should like at least to clarify what I mean with reference to a specific model. When I express these things in a rather general way, as I have been doing here, it may well seem quite clear to you, or at least to those of you who have followed me up to this point. But whenever concrete thought is involved, and particularly whenever concrete methodological arguments are involved, you will repeatedly discover that this proves much more difficult than it all sounds in abstracto. Thus, it seems to be an almost ineradicable intellectual disease in Germany that we typically adopt a dual perspective with regard to the social sciences. On the one side, we have those who say, of course, we have to think in a radically sociological and empirical way, to think in a historicist manner, and there cannot really be anything firm or solid here, for all that is clearly relativized through insight into this dynamic character of things into the dynamic character of things. On the other side, we have those who defend the view that every social science or every science that takes human beings as its subject matter must be oriented towards what people love to call a set of firm or supposedly eternal values or a ray, a range or series of values as we might say in German. Only recently when I gave a lecture in Munich on individual and society, a young academic hailing from sociology, I believe, informed me that I would either have to think in radically sociological terms or I would have to have to provide an anthropology and that we would get nowhere without one or the other. And if in response one tries to unfold the rather more complex and differentiated dialectical structure, which I am attempting to present here, people immediately tend to assimilate this conceptual approach to a relativistic historicism or to a form of thought for which in the final analysis there is no such thing as the concept of truth. I would be more than happy if I had at least managed in these lectures to disabuse you of this assimilation or identification and to make something clear to you that I can only really formulate here as a thesis, that I am just as emphatically opposed to relativistic sociology in the style of Pareto or his imitator Mannheim as I am to the ontological anthropologies of today whether we are talking about Scheller, Heidegger, or Gellin, and that the model of thought which I am attempting to outline for you here is precisely one that refuses to recognize this very alternative. In other words, dialectical theory holds fast to the idea of truth, a dialectic which was incapable of bringing the measure of truth to bear so rigorously and persistently upon every claim to knowledge that this latter would, would dissolve in the face of it would already lack the power without which no dialectical process could ever be grasped at all. And the idea of truth is already involved in the insight into untruth, namely in the critical motif that is the decisive dimension of dialectic as, it, as its necessary condition. The notion of exercising critique without thereby capturing the untruth of the matter in question is meaningless, yet the concept of truth which is called into play here is not something transcendent to the phenomena themselves. This is precisely what the dichotomous consciousness of the present finds so hard to grasp, namely what is at stake in dialectic as a whole, that while the theme of truth is ineluctably and unconditionally posited and intended in this moment of critique, in the moment of thought which cannot but press onward, the truth in question cannot itself be fixed and reified as something beyond the phenomena. Rather, the truth must be sought within the life of the phenomena themselves. And the individual phenomenon must be questioned with regard to itself, with regard to its own inter internal consistency, if it is to be convicted of its own untruth. Perhaps I may express this in analogy with a, with a theological mode of, dis of discourse and say that the dialectical concept of truth is a negative concept of truth just as there is a negative theology. If Spinoza proclaimed the celebrated proposition verum index sui a falsi, we would declare that falsum index sui a veri, 
that there is no tangible, positive, or thing-like concept of truth such as could be vouchsafed, only by the assertion of an immediate identity of the order of things and the order of things. On the other hand, the power from which all insight into untruth lives can only be the idea of truth. It is just that we cannot lay claim to this idea itself as something given, for it is more a source of illumination by which determinate negation or insight into determinate untruth may transpire, as in the saying from Pandora, which I recently adopted as the motto for something of mine, destined to see illumined things, not light. In other words, dialectical thought cannot accept the traditional distinction between genesis and validity either. It cannot endorse the radically psychologistic conception or the psychologistic view in general that every kind of truth is reducible to its point of origin, that truth itself is displaced once we have got behind it and uncovered how it has arisen. Here I would express the appeal to the insight of Nietzsche, who rightly objected to, to the traditional idea that what has come to be can never be true. In other words, that what has emerged can never be anything other than what it, it has emerged from. But if you accept the dialectical conception that I have tried to develop for you in contrast to any philosophy of origins, namely that what has emerged is or may be qualitatively other than that from which it has emerged, then we can relinquish the belief that the truth of some spiritual content is necessarily comprised or compromised or disqualified through reference to its genesis. On the other hand, we must recognize something else in turn, that the hypo hypostasis of any truth without regard to the process in which the life of truth consists, in which it emerges, in which it expires, in which indeed it finds its own content, that any such hypo hypostasis of truth in contrast to its emergence, in other words, the absolutization of validity in contrast to genesis, is just as false as the relativ relativization of truth in terms of mere genesis. And here too, any dialectical analysis must effectively demolish the alternative into which it would otherwise be pressed, must comprehend this alternative itself as merely apparent, as a product of a reified form of thought, rather than allowing itself to be subjected to such an alternative in the first place. And something analogous holds in another context, if I may touch on this at least in a passing or cursory fashion, for it is obviously impossible at this point to provide a full analysis of all the categories involved. All I can do is introduce them here and try and elucidate them in the light of some of the fundamental reflections we have developed. Thus, something similar holds for the whole complex of issues surrounding the so-called concept of value, a concept which for its part actually arises in philosophy, only when its intended object is itself no longer substantial. That is to say, when the given order of existence is superseded by rigid and administrative concepts, which are then specifically set up before us as norms or values, or even as guiding conceptions. On one hand, the notion of supposedly value-free thought, as emphatically defended by the positivist conception of science, and as epistemologically formulated by Max Weber, already strikes me as extremely problematic, precisely because the very distinction between true and false is, if you like, a value distinction. Unless I ascribe priority to the true over the false in some way or other, unless I maintain something like the primacy of the true over the false, then that concept of the objectivity of thought upon which the notion of value freedom specifically insists must forfeit its meaning. On the other hand, however, it is just as dogmatic to swear by certain values, supposedly enthroned beyond all history, and then, like Schiller, or Scheller, introduce an external criterion defined in terms of these rigid values, and in relation to which all content is measured. This leads precisely to the kind of anachronistic thought where criteria such as bindung or bonding are brought to bear in an in abstracto upon social situations and structures of behavior, which in accordance with their intrinsic character cannot possibly be measured against such a criterion in this way. Thus we see that here too, the task of dialectical thought is not to mediate between concepts of this kind. It would be merely comical to say, for example, well, there are, there are indeed no eternal values, 
but there are certainly relative values with respect to each particular epoch. And within the epoch in question, we must keep to the values which specifically hold for this epoch. Now, 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 I do not think that I need to present the comical aspect of this approach in further detail, which is hardly diminished by the fact that there are innumerable philosophies which actually imagine they can successfully deal with the so-called problem of historicism in this way. The solution to this problem, it seems to me, lies in the recognition that a genuine analysis of the concept of value itself leads us to its condition, conditions and its inadequacy, while it is equally clear that the concept of value freedom cannot strictly be realized either. Thus a form of thought which understands these categories themselves in the process of their constitution will not simply negate one of these concepts in favor of the other, but will rise above this alternative and thereby specifically attempt to appropriate those normative moments which are generally grasped by the concept of value only in their abstract and reified form. I have already said that the relevant criterion or the only possibility which dialectical thought acknowledges as, as such must be imminent in character, and I believe that it is precisely here, if anywhere, that genuinely contemporary thought can learn something absolutely decisive from Hegel's thought, namely from his demand that thought must not bring any external criteria to bear upon the matter, which was indeed the characteristic approach of the time, but rather abandon itself to the matter itself and derive its criterion solely from the latter precisely by simply looking on, as Hegel himself puts it. And this is the decisive moment of the dialectic, that the object to which dialectical thought addresses itself is not something intrinsically featureless, which acquires determination only through the way in which we impose a categorical network upon it. Rather, the object in question is also already something determinate within itself. In other words, there is no object, precisely insofar as it presents itself to us as something determinate, which does not also already harbor thought, does not harbor subject within itself. In other words, at this point in the dialectic, there is a moment of idealism, namely the reference to subjectivity as something mediated, a moment which must also be retained, however critically or skeptically we otherwise resist the general claim of idealism to grasp or produce the world out of itself. On the other hand, this approach is not idealist in character, for the moment which I have just described as subjective is itself precisely only a moment, and the underlying concept of subjectivity itself in this connection is something abstract, is an abstraction from those living subjects, those living human beings, whose thought belongs to the determination of the oppositions in question. And precisely on account of this abstractness, on account of this untruth, if you will, this moment cannot itself be turned into something absolute either cannot be turned into something which simply exists in itself. For the, subject, for the subject is just as inevitably mediated through the object as the object in turn is also precisely mediated by thought. In this connection, there is one other thing that I would just like to say here. The prevailing form of thought typically proceeds in a dichotomous fashion. On the one hand, it undertakes to gather facts well, on the other, it says, of course, we also need some kind of value system to organize the facts, for otherwise we shall never be finished with them. Yet there is also an arbitrary and contingent moment inscribed in such dichotomous thinking, even and indeed especially so when it presents itself in a highly absolutist or dogmatic manner. And it is this, the act of evaluation, or whatever it is that appears to transcend the relativity and contingent contingency of the merely given with which I am engaged is inevitably referred back to some standpoint or other, and the choice or adoption of the standpoint itself is implicitly treated as something which is effectively contingent. I am talking about the way someone will pursue their investigations, as a scientist, for example, and then say, but as a Christian, I also have to assess the facts I am dealing with in the light of my norms, or speaking as a socialist, I must assess them in this way, or again, speaking as a German, or whatever it may be. Perhaps you will forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, if I offer you some rather crude and banal intellectual advice here. 
but in the course of these lectures, you may rightly le learn to be skeptical about all statements which involve the words speaking as, I think. The moment that you say speaking as, I think, you have yourself already relativized the truth you are about to claim as an absolute truth in adopting this form of words and thus effectively fall short of your own intentions. And what is more, you thereby confirm and strengthen that social schizophrenia of thought which splits up human consciousness in such a way that individual consciousness may function precisely as scientist, as citizen, as Christian, as private person, as professional person, or as whatever else. I am well aware that this phenomenon of social schizophrenia that I have just described is itself, of course, grounded in the functionalized character of modern professional life and ultimately in the unfolding economic tendencies of our time, and that this cannot therefore be changed merely by an act of will or a philosophical edict. So I harbor no great illusions about the effect of my sage advice in this regard, but if we reflect on these things, if we no longer naively go along with them, if we draw them within reach of philosophical critique, as I have attempted to do here, albeit in a rather fragmentary way, then I believe we may move beyond these habitual ways of thinking. On the other hand, it is quite clear to me, and what is a poor dialectical thinker to do except to show the difficulties, to show how far we are actually imprisoned, how far thought is walled in on every side, that any appeal, that any appeal to the whole and undivided human being, indeed to the undiminished human being fully capable of genuine acts of cognition, also has a rather powerless ring to it, and it remains the case that the insight which the specialist possesses with regard to a particular field, a field which he or she really understands something about, and this holds for poetry just as much as for medicine, is generally superior to that possessed by someone whose undiminished humanity actually depends on never being exposed to the discipline involved in any concrete specific field. In short, dialectical thought refuses to provide intellectual recipes. I have often said as much in abstracto. I believe I have shown with reference to certain models today just how little the dialectic has to offer in the way of recipes, how little it can provide for anyone. And I believe that unless you can renounce the idea that thought should give you something, as they say, unless you are prepared instead to give something to thought, namely to give yourselves to it, then you should eschew dialectical thought altogether. I would strongly recommend anyone who cannot do these things to stay with traditional forms of thought, which are not only generally accepted, but also provide a rather comforting sense of security, which anyone who engages with dialectical questions must abandon. When I speak of renouncing the usual sense of security, this immediately brings me to the position of dialectical thought with respect to the prevailing logical forms of thought. And I must also say something to you about this here. The most important question that arises in this connection is the issue of definition. And it is most curious to note that, while very significant philosophers such as Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche have emphatically issued the concept of definition, standard intellectual practice, practice in countless areas of thought has continued to insist upon definition and indeed not only in the context of the natural sciences, but also in the field of jurisprudence, in contemporary forms of mathematical economic theory, and in numerous examples of what we may perhaps call hyphen philosophies, that is, philosophies which are concerned with, with logistical methods. And all this in the belief that, once we have firmly and cleanly defined a certain concept, we are thereby absolved of all further worries, and now stand on absolutely secure ground. This sense of security is a deception, and one of the tasks of dialectical thought, among others, is to shatter the deceptive confidence of this faith in definitions. I would just like to make some brief ob observations here about the problem of definition, and then offer some related comments about the problem of certain other logical forms, in the hope that you may at least find it helpful to recall some of this, when it comes to your own concrete work. A definition is basically a way of determining concepts by reference to other concepts. It is astonishing to see how widely and unreflectively this procedure 
of determining concepts through concepts is generally regarded as obligatory today, without people even realizing that it involves us in a kind of infinite regress, which undermines the very sense of security that one wanted to ensure in the first place. But in addition to that, I would like to remind you here of the elementary logical fact, which may not actually be as familiar to some of you as it ought to be to all of you, namely that we can in principle determine concepts in two ways either through other concepts or, and for didactic reasons, I remain entirely on traditional logical ground here by pointing to the states of affairs which are brought together by the concepts in question. And traditional logic so specific, specifically tells us that every concept, insofar it is reduced to other concepts, ultimately requires a final fulfillment where we can directly indicate or point to the thing or state of affairs which is intended by the relevant concept. Thus to, th thus, to point out the obvious, you cannot define the concept red, but can only show what is meant by the concept red by presenting various shades of red before the eyes of those to whom you are trying to explain the concept and allowing them, within the parameters of the psychology of perception, to grasp the feature common to all these individual perceptions of red under the concept red. In other words, we can define concepts or we can determine them dialectically, to use the technical epistemological term, and this already indicates the limitation of the usual concept of definition. The primacy which is accorded to definition today harbors a kind of archaism, a regress to the sort of thinking which predated the critique which first emphatically showed that no truth can properly be derived from concepts alone, that truth can only be fulfilled. But this produces a whole series of consequences for the position of dialectical thought in relation to the practice of definition itself, something I would like to talk to you about in our next session.